All right, so let's just take a minute and talk about um, on the AP exam, if you were asked to discuss bias, what exactly would you need to do? So number one, you're going to have to do two things um, if you're asked to describe or discuss the bias of some sort of sampling design. Number one, please make sure you identify and context the problem with the design, and then you want to explain how this problem would systematically lead to an overestimate or underestimate of the population proportion, mean, sample, whatever you're taking a look at. So let's just take a minute and look at an example. So let's say you're in biology class and you were asked how, um, explain how using your biology class as a sample to estimate the percentage of students that have dissected a worm could result in bias. So what is the problem with this and how would this lead to an underestimate or overestimate of the population because we're checking to see the percentage of students that have dissected a worm. Well, this is a convenient sample. You're in your biology class, and obviously since you're asking people in the biology class, it's probably going to include a much higher proportion of students who have dissected a worm than the population of your high school. Um, and oftentimes AP Biology is a second year biology course, so most likely everybody in that course would have dissected a worm in either biology or AP Biology, and it would lead to an overestimate of the actual population proportion. All right, so, um, so hopefully you have realized that um, convenient sampling is not a great way to sample. So that's an example of a bad sampling. So convenient samples are almost guaranteed to show some sort of bias, either overestimate or underestimate, because they're easy samples to take. So nothing in life comes easy, right? Um, voluntary response samples are another example of how to sample poorly, okay? What's a voluntary response sample? A voluntary response sample consists of people who choose themselves by responding to a general appeal. Voluntary response samples often show bias because people with strong opinions often in the same direction are most likely to respond. So what exactly does all of that wording mean? That really means a voluntary response sample means that anybody can respond to the survey. So usually people, if there's a survey on the back of a truck that says, hey, please, please call if I am driving poorly, that's a voluntary response sample. Most of the time, people are not going to call to say, how's my driving? They're not going to call and say that the truck driver is doing a good job, but they might call if something goes wrong and say that they're doing a bad job. All right, so that's a voluntary response sample. Anybody on the road that sees that can answer that question, and it's most likely going to overestimate the people that think that that driver is driving poorly because they're only going to respond when they have a bad situation or a bad experience. Okay, some other examples are American Idol, Dancing with the Stars. Anybody can call in and answer those questions. Usually people with strong opinions, people that watch the show, those are the only people that are going to respond to those types of surveys. All right, so take a look at these two. Um, go ahead and pause the recording and identify the type of sampling method that was used and then explain how it might lead to bias. All right, so how do those leads to bias? Number one, this was convenient sampling. Um, he's just looking at the oranges on the top, so this leads the investigator usually to overestimate the quality of oranges because the farmer could realize this and just put his best oranges on top. The bottom one is a voluntary response, so this is only showing the opinions of those who reported to the poll. So since it's the opinions of those that reported, it's most likely to overestimate the true percentage of Los Angeles residents who would respond no, okay, because anybody could have answer that question. All right, so what else can go wrong? Um, a, how you choose your sample, and B, um, there are two other problems that can often be difficult to avoid because our goal is to not have bias, not systematically overestimate or underestimate the population proportion, mean percentage. All right, this one is really hard to avoid, um, is under coverage. So under coverage basically means there are some members of the population that cannot be chosen in the sample. So if you're doing a sample by emailing everybody, you are going to miss everybody that doesn't have an email account. So you're not accounting for potentially a large proportion of the population that could respond to the survey. Almost all surveys have some sort of under coverage. 
thinking about calling on a landline. A lot of people don't have landlines anymore, so everybody without a landline is not gonna be part of that survey. If we're talking about a sample of households, all right, we could miss people that are homeless, people that are in prison, students that are in college. So you have to be really careful and think about how can you minimize under coverage as much as possible. Okay, so the types of sampling under coverage can both lead to overestimates or underestimates of the population proportion. So with this, basically somebody else, somebody's left out. Um, so if somebody's left out, what kind of bias can this potentially lead to? Okay, like I said, it could be an over and, uh, overestimate or underestimate of the population. You're missing a whole group of people's opinions. All right, so what else can go wrong? Um, something called non-response. So what exactly is non-response? Non-response is when an individual is chosen for a sample but can't be contacted or refuses to participate. So what happens is maybe Fairfax County was doing a survey on how many computers every single person in Fairfax County owns, how many households. So they send out a survey to every single household in Fairfax County. Non-response would be those people that were contacted, they got the survey in the mail, but they never filled it out and sent it back in. They're refusing to participate. Or maybe some people can't be contacted because um, maybe somebody is living overseas for a couple of years, but they would be back in Fairfax County in a couple of years. Or maybe something got lost in the mail, so they never got a survey. How is this different than voluntary response? So the major difference between these two is with non-response, it happens after the sample has been selected. Voluntary response Anybody can respond, and it's mostly people with strong opinions, okay, so that's going to lead to an overestimate or underestimate, depending upon what you're looking at. Um, with non-response, the people are chosen, but they refuse to participate. Okay, so voluntary response, they're not pre-chosen, anyone can participate. Okay, and just remember when we're talking about bias, to state the direction. That's really important. Is this giving us an overestimate? or underestimate of the population. All right, so what is response bias? So we had non-response bias, people aren't responding. <laughs> we had convenient sampling, which is not good. We had voluntary response bias, people respond, but they usually have strong opinions. Now what exactly is just straight up response bias? So this means usually when people give inaccurate answers to survey questions. So oftentimes if people are being surveyed and the interviewer asks the question, they can often influence how you answer the question. Um, so it could be how a question is worded. So how happy are you with your life? So this might, since there's asking how happy are you with your life, you might not state that you're actually unhappy with it. Um, the interviewer is a huge part in this. So when you go to the doctors and they say, how many alcoholic beverages have you had in the last month? Okay, are you gonna give an honest answer? How much fried food do you eat? Are you gonna give an honest answer? Um, remember that human nature comes into play. And when you're talking to a police officer and they said, hey, can you be honest about the number of times you, you sped? Well, maybe you're not going to want to answer that properly because if he sees your car on the road again, he's going to be looking for you speeding. So the interviewer can have a huge part in the type of bias. Okay, so each of the following is a possible source of bias in a sample survey. All right, so what I'd like you to do with these questions is state what kind of bias that you think is um, happening in this case. Go ahead, pause it, and then take a look at the next slide. Okay, so number one, the first one was under coverage because um, anyone without a phone couldn't be represented in this situation. So in the second one, non-response because people um, could not be contacted. So remember, non-response is a part of the population where they're pre-chosen to be part of the sample, but they couldn't be contacted or they refused to answer. Um, the last one, the letter C was under coverage. It's a convenient sample. So anyone not walking by on the sidewalk doesn't have the opportunity to answer. And then in letter D, we're taking a look at the question. It sounds like there's not a problem with the landfill. The question will result in fewer people suggesting that we should ban disposable diapers. So the proportion 
of those who would say yes to this survey is most likely to be smaller than the proportion that would say yes to a more fairly worded question. So the wording of your question is especially important um, whenever you are trying to get a good sample. All right, so how to avoid badly worded questions. So um, here's a link right here. If you could just take a minute and click on it, um, it will just give you some five common survey question mistakes. It'll ruin your data. So this is just a good idea if you were going to come up with questions on your own, um, how would you word them so that you could get the most accurate answers possible? All right, so how do we sand them? How do we sand them? How do we sample well? The best way to sample is through random sampling. So Basically, a sample is chosen by chance alone, um, and a sample that's chosen by chance rules out both favoritism by the sampler and self-selection by the respondent. So when we're random, ran, random sampling, anyone in our population has the opportunity to be chosen and participate. So what random sampling does, it's basically the use of chance to select a sample, and it's our central principle of statistic sampling. So it's really important to understand that random sampling helps to reduce bias and um, give us a better picture of what the true population proportion, whatever, mean is. All right, now, a simple random sample, SRS, and this is the only time you can use this abbreviation is SRS. It always means simple random sample. Basically, what it means is every set of individuals from the population has a chance to be chosen. All right, so what that means is if you have 15, um, if 15 is your population, you're choosing groups of three, every possible sample of size three out of those 15 have an equal chance of being selected. So it's like throwing 15 people in a hat and then selecting three out of them, uh, three out of the hat, throwing 15 people, throwing the 15 people back in, selecting three more, throwing 15 people back in, selecting three more, and doing that over and over again until you have all possible samples of size three that are selected. So in practice, people don't use hats. They use random number generators by a calculator or computer to choose samples. Uh, if you don't have technology, you can use a table of random digits. So what's the basic idea of a simple random sample? This is really important. Every individual has an equal chance of being selected. All right, so what that means is if you have um, if you are separate, if you want a simple random sample is not separating it into boys and girls and choosing three boys and three girls to get a total of six, while you're not necessarily having the same chance of being selected is if they're all in one group. So a simple random sample has to be one large group. You're not separating it. Every individual has to be independent of each other and you want your simple random sample to be a good representation of the population. So basically by choosing random individuals, we're hoping that we'll, we'll get a sample that is similar to the population. It helps to eliminate bias, all right, so it's going to help us eliminate an overestimate or underestimate, but it does not guarantee that it completely gets rid of bias. A simple random sample will never eliminate it. It will just help us to reduce it, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always going to be a good representation of the population. Since it's completely done by chance, you could end up getting everybody, if you're doing a, a survey of Fairfax County, you could end up getting everybody that has five or more computers just by chance alone. All right, so what is the difference um, between sampling with replacement or without replacement? So this is going to go back to this independent clause. All right, sampling with replacement means once a person is picked, they can go back into the drawing. So the number or person can be picked more than once. Sampling without replacement means once a person or number is picked, they're done. This means that the probability of choosing a person changes with each pick. So think about a group of 15 people. If I take one out, the probability of getting that second one is now out of 14 instead of 15. If I pick a third one, the probability is now going to be out of um, 13 instead of 15. So every time you choose somebody, um, the probability of choosing that next person actually increases because there's less numbers in the hat. All right, so the key here is that every group of n individuals has an equal chance of being selected. This example is not a simple random sample. You have 10 boys and 10 girls in a classroom. You want to choose six students. Put all the boys' names in a hat, mix it up, and choose three. All the girls' names in a hat, mix it up, and choose three. You randomly choose six. Why is this not a simple random sample? Well, it's because we want six students in our sample, and every group of six has to have an equal chance of being selected. 
That means six girls could be chosen, six boys could be chosen, four girls, two boys, five girls, one girl. This method here eliminates all possibilities of six. In this case, there's always going to be three girls and three boys. So just always think about throwing everybody in a hat. If you can do that and get your sample, you're good.